so warehouse wizardry is our topic today, and you can see uh, the picture on the right-hand side there of Mal Walker, <laughs> uh, who's joining us today to share his expertise and insights. Uh, through Logistics Bureau, uh, I've seen all the registrations come in, but there's quite a few people who don't. So uh, let me just take one minute to uh, tell you who we are and uh, why we're here talking about warehousing today. So Logistics Bureau Group is based in Australia and Southeast Asia. Uh, those little yellow dots are consulting assignments that we've done around the region and, and there are a few in other countries. So we have people online today from Argentina. Yes, we've done work in Argentina in the mining sector uh, and Europe as well. And Logistics Bureau Group is predominantly made up of consulting businesses that you can see on the left, Logistics Bureau in Australia, Logistics Bureau Asia, based in Bangkok, Singapore and Ho Chi Minh City, and Benchmarking Success, which is a performance benchmarking company. Uh, and we're also very keen on education, so we have a, our own supply chain school, uh, we have an online training program called Supply Chain Secrets, and we actually have another school starting later this year year which we'll uh, reveal in a few months time and uh, also we have a social enterprise that we uh, we fund in the southern Philippines called Virtual Done Well so that that's a, a virtual outsourcing company and uh, that really is the uh, the full set of businesses in Logistics Bureau Group and what qualifies us to talk about warehousing this morning well I'm not sure that I'm that well qualified but Mal is and I'll introduce him in a moment um, but we've completed about 1200 consulting assignments around the world to date uh, across 23 countries and uh, that's over about a 16 year period uh, and we like to share what we sort of learned through these consulting assignments as well and uh, so there's a number of books that we've produced uh, on the topic. Now as we're going through the presentation today um, we're going to cover, you'll, you'll appreciate that in an hour there's, there's only so much we can cover but these are the, the things that we're going to try and cover for you so we're going to look at common performance issues that impact cost and service in warehouses. Uh, we're going to give you some easy DIY do-it-yourself fixes for your warehouse. Uh, we'll highlight where people often go wrong in warehouse design. Uh, and we'll try and give you some tips on upgrades that can extend the life of your facilities. And uh, do hang on till the end because uh, we'll give you some links there for some free resources and other information that you can access as well if you found this interesting and you want to get a little bit deeper into the topic. Okay, so uh, at this point, um, I should really start introducing our key speaker. So, uh, Mal Walker. Now, Mal, last time I spoke, I think, has about 35 years' experience. So, welcome, Mal. Thank you very much. Um, so, and that's predominantly in the area of warehousing and distribution. Uh, we're very lucky to have Mal with us here today because not only has he worked with third-party logistics companies, uh, but he's done a lot of work as well with suppliers of materials handling equipment. So all of those companies that provide the racking systems and the conveyor systems and so on, Mal spent you know, decades literally working in that industry as well. He's helped m many, many businesses across most industries uh, with warehousing issues, either designing new warehouses or trying to make existing warehouses uh, more efficient. And if you're wondering what number four is about, um, Mal does sort of um, work on the basis of work hard, play hard. You know, he's one of these sorts of guys. Of course. And he has his own band and he's the drummer. So <laughs> a bit unusual for a consultant maybe. And we're available for parties, weddings and <laughs> functions. He's available for functions. What's the band called? <laughs> Transmission. Transmission band. So you can go and look that up. You'll probably even see a clip of, of Mal. But enough of the, uh, the joviality. Let's, uh, let's move on now with the topic at hand and now I'm, I'm going to hand over to you and uh, I'll, I'll jump in if, if need be as we go through. Okay, thanks very much Rob and uh, I also extend a, a welcome to everybody. It's uh, terrific to have so many people that have come on board to talk about a really exciting topic of warehousing and, and I, we sort of jest there but uh, you know I think warehousing is an interesting topic. There's a lot in it and uh, you can make or break your warehouse just by doing some simple things. So what I plan to do today is run through some basic concepts that everyone can follow. I'm not going to delve too much into detail, but I'm going to give an overview of, uh, of quite a few aspects, as, as Rob just mentioned a few minutes ago. Um, but towards the end, I'll also run through a, a case study of a medium-sized uh, warehouse operation. So if, uh, if you're from a company that's putting 
in a lot of or looking to put in a lot of high level automation we won't be covering that in this session so we're looking more at uh, small to medium type uh, operations so hopefully that's okay with everybody now to kick off I'm going to run over the seven common performance issues that impact upon cost and service and you can see on your screen what they are we've got multiple touches of goods multi-directional flow stock is in the wrong place stock locations are unclear, inefficient labour, racking and equipment poorly designed and loading and unloading and traffic congestion. Now I've only got seven there but to be honest I could put about 30 but in my view and in my opinion having worked with many companies these are the ones that cause organisations the most issues when we're talking about warehousing operations. So let's go through those one at a time and I'm just flicking over to the uh, next slide now. So the first thing, multiple touches of goods. You know we have a, we have a location in Australia called Canberra. Uh, it's, uh, it's our Australian capital territory. It's where we have uh, our government buildings and so forth. And it's a lovely place but it has lots of lots of uh, roundabouts um, in the road system and often people talk about going around in circles down there. Well, unfortunately, in many warehouses, we find that people go around and around in circles. And they do that, they have multiple touches of goods. Now, I'm going to tell you that in many warehouses, people can touch goods up to maybe uh, 10 to 12 times. Um, but best practice operations normally touch the goods about four times or less. But there's always a balance between labour and capital investment. If you want to go below four, you normally have to invest in some automation or you know, expensive materials handling equipment. But for many companies, five to seven times is acceptable. Okay, so that's the first thing. We'll try and avoid the multiple touches. The second one, multi-directional flow. As I said a moment ago, um, people can go around in circles. They're going, you have operators going in all directions, receiving, put away, picking, packaging, and dispatching. We try to avoid that because it wastes time and it's unsafe. So, as much as possible, as a concept, I try and encourage one way flows, and that's how we, we plan uh, warehouse layouts and operations. Now, the next one to the point about is your stock in the right place. This is a common problem. Um, often companies by their nature put stock in the wrong location. So they may have some fast moving goods at the back of the warehouse and they may have slow moving goods at the front of the warehouse. So as a rule of thumb, we try to get about 10% of the products which is normally equivalent to 75% of volume, we try to place those stocks nearest to the picking face and dispatch. And the second class, about 15% of products, um, they often represent maybe about 15% of volume, we place these at a mid-range location. And the, would you believe it, about 80% of products, which typically represent about 10% of volume, we place the stock furthest from the pick face or dispatch area. So by doing this, we're able to optimise travel times to put away those stocks, but also to pick them and dispatch them. Um, so it's useful to place stock in a warehouse according to movement. So over on the next page here, I've got graphically, you can see this. On the right here, we have a picking mezzanine or a raised storage area and we have some conveyors here leading out to a dispatch area. The area in blue is where I would recommend we put the A-class stock. So we try and get the faster moving items in those areas and we have people working in here, and this drawing's in plan, we have people working in this uh, storage area uh, picking to a zone route conveyor system. So these are the A-class. The yellow ones or the medium movers are just behind that. They are in this yellow area. 
Can I just ask a question here, Mal? Because we, we've got people on the webinar from all over the world, and um, could, could I just ask maybe those who have conveyor systems in their warehouses, could you just raise your hand just to give us an idea of the level of technology being used in the warehouses? So just click that that hand button. That's great. We've got some hands going up. Um, okay, because um, it's interesting, you know, when we do work uh, in different sort of countries around the world, the levels of technology do vary considerably. So yeah, Cherie, Sean, Scott, yeah, you've got a degree of technology. And uh, of course, it all comes down to, uh, you know, the cost benefit of putting in technologies like that, whether you're going to save significant amount of money in labour costs and that yeah, that's, that's correct. So yes, yeah, so, and certainly there's a justification level where conveyors and other materials handling equipment um, actually is justified. Mm. And we, we look at that in terms of the cost of labour and, uh, and the rate and volumes of, of products moving through the warehouse. Just to continue on there, so what we're looking at here in the blue and the yellow, that's the ground level of the mezzanine. And this is the pink area, which is the area above. Okay, so this is the upper deck. And I've shown it as pink, and this is where we would put all of the slower movers. Now, this is not a unique concept for warehousing. But Rob, I'm often surprised at how many companies don't apply that basic thinking about placement of stock. Yeah, and I think for those who, who haven't come across the term mezzanine before as well, I mean it's just another you know, floor, if you like, that's, that's utilising the space in the warehouse. So you often hear people talk about utilising the cube in a warehouse. So you know, lots of people utilise the footprint, but they forget about the height as well. And certainly a lot of warehouses I go into, you see a lot of empty space above the equipment, above the conveyors or the packing area and things like that. Yes, indeed. So, yeah, it's, it's, this is a great way to optimise that space and, and yeah, make mm. best use of the cube. Okay, now we're going to slip over into uh, stock locations. Now, all of us live in, in a house or a unit or a flat or something like that, and we all have street addresses. So we all get received mail and so forth. But it's amazing how many warehouses do not actually have a positive location numbering system. And another thing, we find that some ERP systems, the enterprise resource systems that run these warehouses, do not actually allow to have multiple stock locations. And Rob, that's another question we could ask is how many actually um, have systems that allow well, multiple stock? Well, I guess stock? the interesting question would be is in for those of you here who run warehouses, how many times do you have people in the warehouse going to pick a product, to select a product for dispatch, and, the, and either the product's not there or the wrong quantity's there? Yeah. Could maybe you just put your hand up and we'll get an idea of that. Yeah, we've got a few hands going up. And, you know, that's not just about location systems, obviously. Well, there's a lot of hands going up. <laughs> um, it's not just about the location systems. It's about the, um, you know, the IT systems and the inventory management as well. But, yes. Yeah, go on. yeah. So obviously, the the address system is uh, is linked very closely to the warehouse uh, ERP system or the warehouse management system that operates it. Um, but in both cases, if you can't find your stock, you lose time, and uh, and that's a disaster. What I have over the page um, is just a very simple slot numbering system that that we use for many uh, warehouse operations that we have, and I know that some of you will have your own codes. Um, but this one's uh, this one's just a basic protocol that uh, that we would normally apply. So you can see there, you've got aisle codes, you have a bay address, you have uh, beam level here. So aisle, bay, beam level, and shelf and tray position. And one thing that's come in in recent times is not only the barcode of the same number here, but also a check digit. Now the check digit is for a new type of technology, which some of you will be aware of. Is that for voice picking? Voice picking. Oh, okay. So voice picking is, uh, it, in a sense, it's like the next generation of, uh, of picking. And often companies, are, whilst we've got the barcode there, we're only using those to verify accuracy in, on many occasions, accuracy that we found the right location. But the main um, accuracy of the pick comes from uh, actually using uh, the voice person with the voice system. So for those who haven't come code. across that, maybe we can sort of explain that very quickly. So uh, whereas in, in most um, 
warehouses that have a degree of technology, the picker will go to this location, they'll scan that barcode to make sure they're at the correct location, uh, and then they'll select the product. With voice picking, they're actually wearing a headset, and it will tell them, go to position AA1, A1A, A1A, pick two, uh, and then they have to enter that check digit to or say it, basically, back to the computer. Correct. Okay, look, so that's lot numbering systems. Now, we're going to move on because we've got a lot to cover. We're going to the next point, which is uh, inefficient labour. And this is probably one of the biggest performance issues that, that companies have. And there's always a question about how do you know if your labour is inefficient or otherwise? And some of the things that we normally look at when we look at labour is how many normal hours are worked versus what, what are the overtime hours. And then how many order lines are picked per day, how many cartons, each or pallets are picked. So it's there's a there's a mix of things there. And I guess we you know, we'd be interested in what your experience is, whether you have any other types of uh, of measurement devices for, for labour. Yeah, so I mean if you've got some ideas there, by all means type that into the uh, the chat box or the question box. Uh, are there any other key measures that you use and it's useful to share those? But these will be fairly typical ones, I think. Yeah. Okay, so look, while, while, we're do, while we're waiting for those, I'll just go over to the next page. Yeah. Okay. So this is, um, did I miss one? Yeah, sorry. Oh, we did, we did. We missed the page, yeah. Okay, so this one. This is a very common one uh, called the order processing rate. This is a measure of output efficiency, really. It's, a, it's often I, uh, I look at this measure before all others. Um, it's a non-financial measure, but it really looks at the number of order lines processed divided by the labour hours vested in picking them. And often you hear about large amounts of overtime being worked in warehouses. Um, but sometimes the reason why they, people work overtime is not so much that the warehouse is busy, it's because they need a few extra dollars in their pay packet, uh, which we understand. But in terms of warehousing efficiency, we want to try and maximise the number of order lines processed for every hour that's put into that operation. Um, so I, I use that as, a, as an aggregate measure to understand how one warehouse might be working uh, against another. So over here, the next page, and I'm not going to go too much into the detail, but we've just got some data from a particular company, uh, Newco, Proprietary Limited. And we've, we've listed down all the normal time, the overtime, and the total hours. Um, and we've done some dollars, and we've done some statistics. So if I now skip to the next page, this is a graph of that data. Now, the whole point here is that the blue line represents the normal hours for all of these people. But the red line looks at the day's labour in overtime that those people are working. Now my point here is that the gap between that red line and the green line, which is a statistical measure of standard deviation, the point is that, that is, that's the potential uh, for improvement. We can try and close that gap, then we're going to get a lot more out of our warehouse and we will we'll avoid those overtime costs. So hopefully that's clear for our, no, our no, attendees. That's, yeah, that's fine. Okay, so having said that, over on the next page here, I've just given you a bit of an insight into a number of industries, you know, cosmetics, stationery, hardware, and so on. Um, TCF is textiles, clothing, and footwear. As to what the processing rates are, um, typically, of companies that, that I've done work with. And if you look at this, you can see it's fairly low. So what I've tried to do is then, at the same so is, time... Is, is that units per hour? This is, uh, this is order lines picked per man hour. Okay, order lines per man hour, that's a really useful statistic. Yeah. So and the order line, the reason why the order line pick, uh, the order lines is an interesting factor is an order line is the equivalent to a visit to a picking bin, Rob, mm -hmm. where you actually pick stock. Yep. So when we look at uh, warehouses, we count the number of order lines and that tells us how many hits that we have mm -hmm. to make at a given So it's pace. a more accurate um, measure of productivity because if we measure the units, one order line might be one unit and another order line might be ten units, so Correct. order lines is a, is a better measure. Correct. So hopefully that's helpful for everybody. Okay, so the next one relates to 
um, racking systems and equipment. And some of the some of the common issues that we find here is that uh, we've got columns in the middle of aisles. We have racking aisles that are far too narrow, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, sometimes racking systems are oriented orientated the wrong way in a warehouse, and that can cause bottlenecks. And often the bottlenecks are designed into the facility, and I've seen many facilities where uh, they have funnels and bottlenecks, and the mind boggles as to why they've been placed there. But to be fair, many companies evolve in their growth pattern. So they, they build part of a warehouse and then they add another part on and then they add an additional area later and suddenly the layout becomes inefficient. So often I suggest to companies uh, that they review their warehouse layout according to the volumetrics of their operation. Uh, so for example, the online boom has really had a big impact for many companies on their warehouse. So in the old days, companies used to pick pallets of goods and cartons of goods, but these days with the online, they're now picking eaches and single units and sending those out mm. to, uh, to customers. So, so customers. the workload basically in the warehouse has gone up considerably. Correct. So that online business has, has prompted a rethink and a redesign of many, many operations. The other area here is that if equipment is over or under engineered, that can cause cost as well, so we need to have a look at that. Now I mentioned uh, racking systems. Wow. You can see in this uh, this warehouse here, there's something in the aisle that's causing an obstruction. Uh, and it's funny here, uh, Rob and and everyone that's listening, but often when you purchase racking, um, racking suppliers love to sell a lot of racking, and they will put up layouts like this. And because they can get more to, racking to pack in. in as much racking as they can. I mean, that is a huge safety issue, isn't it? It is indeed. I mean, the forklift is going to not only run into that and potentially damage the forklift, but <laughs> it could take out that uh, that pillar and the roof could come down. Take out the whole lot. So the point here is that uh, if you ask me, I will always give priority to safety, and I would always put the columns within the racking, even at the sacrifice of extra pallet space storage. So I would have less pallets, but a safer operation. So that's something to think about. Now, to uh, let's let's just go to the outside of the warehouse for a moment and start talking about loading and unloading, and traffic congestion. You know, there's a lot of warehouses that have this, and I'm always surprised at, at companies that haven't thought through their loading and unloading and their traffic flows around the site. Because we often find trucking bays, loading bays that are incorrectly designed. We find sunken docks where they should not have sunken docks. We find open docks where they should have sunken docks. And there's sometimes there's a few so, things. So for those who maybe don't know what a sunken dock is, that's basically where the truck, if you like, reverses down into a pit so that the, uh, the load layer of the truck, the bed of the truck, is at the floor level of the warehouse. Correct. Yeah. And typically you would use those sorts of docks when you're rear loading a vehicle. Yeah. But for example, in Australia, um, we only really um, reload and unload containers that are going for are either being imported or exported overseas. A lot of our vehicles that are going interstate and to regional areas, we sideload. And I've seen a lot of this in Asia and Europe as well. So with the online boom, we've seen more sideloading than inloading. Because it's quicker, presumably. That's correct. You can get to the whole length of the vehicle. Yeah. So that therefore prompts a different uh, design operation. Um, and look, I, I'm, I'm a bit saddened about this because I don't think some of the Australian architects have really got onto this change yet. And so you see sometimes very badly designed docks because they just haven't got onto that concept. So aware, if you have these problems, whoever designed your warehouse may not have understood your business. Um, or your business has changed, to be fair. Okay, look, there's seven common performance issues. Let's have a look at three quick fixes for your warehouse. And the first one is I always advocate using a statistical approach to warehouse operation. And I really avoid planning for averages. You know, Rob, the problem with planning for averages is that 50% of the time you're right, but 50% of the time you're going to be wrong. That's right. 
and, and I'm sure, um, let's just ask uh, everybody here in the webinar, um, who would have a peak in demand through their warehouse at a particular period of the month? And, I, and I'm thinking towards month end, it would be a much higher level of activity through the warehouse. Can we just uh, have a quick show of hands there, click the hand up button? Um, and I think that's an example then of, you know, how if you design for averages, you're just going to be way off. Yeah, yeah, probably half the people are hands going up, you know, and, and it's typically driven by um, sales terms with customers um, because, you know, there's, there's, you almost encourage this activity towards month end. Okay, so yeah, now I'll come, I'll, I'll, we'll come back to this in a moment just to explain that a little bit more succinctly. The second one here is, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, I would kill the overtime bug as much as you can, reduce overtime, use the order processing rate, and I bet my bottom dollar you'll get an improvement within weeks. You don't need to change anything in terms of equipment, but if you just focus on that as a key performance indicator, that can have a major benefit to, you, to your warehouse operation. And the last one is to introduce one-way flow and the minimal touches of goods, and that will also add to your labour efficiency. Can we just talk about, um, and I know you're going to come to the one-way flow in a moment, but um, minimal touching of goods, I mean, that doesn't just apply in the warehouse, that applies right the way through the supply chain, doesn't it? But we, we have to remember every time we touch a product, we move a product, we're incurring cost, uh, and certainly in a warehouse we need to touch it as few times as possible. Correct, absolutely. Okay, look, over on the next page here, and this, for those of you that might have studied statistics at some point in time, this is a bell curve. Um, now, I'm not going to go through the detail of this, but just sufficient to say that this point here is an average, and this point here is one standard deviation from the average. Okay, so we start from a scale here, and this is so th this bottom scale can be from lowest stock level to highest stock level, for example, or lowest. Lowest could be the number of orders picked or something like that. Correct. So, and this is the number of occurrences. So, this is the average standard deviation, two standard deviations, three standard deviations. Now, let's now apply that to a warehouse situation. So sorry, can you just go back to that bell curve? Because while I did study statistics, I hated it, and there's probably people like me on the line. So, what we're saying is uh, the average there in the middle, <coughs> if we plan for that, we're, we're probably. Uh, you know, not going to design for the right volume throughput. If we plan one standard deviation either way, we will cover 84% of occurrences, the Correct. highs and the lows. If we plan for two standard deviations each way, we'll cover almost 98% of, of the, the variation. Correct. Okay, so let's now come over the page here. And this is a, a company that did a lot of shippers picking. A shipper is a, a carton, yep. not single cartons. Plus, they did some inners. So, an inner, like if a shipper is a carton of beer, for example, an inner would be a six, a six pack. pack. Yep. Yeah? And then they do some eaches picking, and the eaches would be a single bottle. Okay, so in that sort of uh, parlance. Now, so what we've done here is we've graphed all of the shippers picked across this year, and you can see that here. And the green line shows the average. And the red line shows the average plus one standard deviation, which is the 84% of occurrences. And the same for the inners and the eaters. And you can see the statistics over here. Now, all we're saying, and you don't need to worry too much about, this, about the statistics, but what we're saying here is that if you design a warehouse for the green line, um, you may be undercutting the design. You're going to have capacity problems. Yeah. Exactly. So, but if you design for the very peak here or here, you may be over-designing the Absolutely. warehouse. Yep. So, what I would advocate is that most companies design for the red line area, which is the 84% level of operation. So, hopefully that's, uh, that's clear to everybody. Okay, we're now going to skip on. And we're covering the topic of where people go wrong in warehouse design. And there's a couple of repeats here, but I'm going to touch on them again. Okay, first of all, they fail to cover all of the requirements for the facility. 
Um, and it's really critical that when you scope a warehouse that you understand all of the things that are going to happen in there. And you know, I've had a couple of assignments, Rob, where we've we've designed a warehouse and we're ready to go, start building it and so on, and they come along and say, Oh, we forgot to tell you that there's three thousand pallets that we have to bring in from the oh, warehouse. That's, that's down very the road. common, isn't it? <laughs> So try and get get the full shopping list before you start. Um, the second one is, and we've already mentioned this, if they design a warehouse for average performance, I can guarantee you're going to get average performance. I, don't, I should probably add, Mel, that uh, if, if people are getting uh, a bit worried about understanding all that statistical stuff, uh, we'll be showing everybody at the end where they can actually access some, some more information and downloads and so on that explain all of this. Indeed. Okay, so... Um, Third one, they obtain the warehouse and then des design the materials handling system. This is very, very common, but some of the smarter companies design the materials handling system first and then they obtain the warehouse. And this is, this is very good thinking because you can, you can avoid a lot of extra costs by doing that. The fourth one, they do not consult with all parties. Um, yeah, it's really dangerous to have just two or three people you know, work in a room and design a warehouse because you really do have to consult widely about all of the dynamics that happen in the warehouse. Yeah, so for sales and marketing people, for example, is the range going to expand? Correct. Are we going to acquire new businesses and That's suddenly right. have to handle more product? Yes. Are there returns? Mm. You know, is the business changing more online? Is it, is it wholesale? Is it retail? Or does it do all of those things? So we need to understand all of those dynamics. In fact, uh, many operations we work in, we design for two or three supply chains at least. So there's the retail chain, the wholesale chain, and the direct online chain. And they all have different transport and delivery dynamics and service times. Okay, number five, they choose equipment that is not matched to the volumes and activities that are performed in the warehouse. Oh dear. You know, I, I've seen that so many times. Um, and I'm thinking back to a, a healthcare company that we worked with many years ago. Um, where they wanted all of the latest technology in the warehouse and they wanted a big picture window uh, in the warehouse where the warehouse manager could show people what was going on in the warehouse. Um, and, and I can remember at the time we said to them, you don't actually need that level of technology, you won't get the payback. And they said, no, but we need to look high tech, we need to look like you know we're leading edge. So uh, yeah, it's interesting how sometimes people pick the technology. Yes, indeed. So the, the lesson there is, uh, you know, don't spend more money than you need to. Um, and this is where you really do need to match up with the volumes. Um, and the last one is, uh, and this sort of relates to um, number three, they design from the outside in, um, whereas we like to design from the inside out. And that way we've got a far better chance of getting the right warehouse. And designing from the inside out basically means let's design how much storage we need, the footprint and the height, let's design how we're going to handle the product and then when we, we have that internal design we basically need to say how big a box do we need to build around it rather than let's go and buy a box and work out how to do yeah. the, the operation inside it. Correct, absolutely. Well listen Rob, that's, that's the end of the preliminaries. Uh, what I'd like, now like to do is just take people through the process of design of a warehouse so that you can, uh, you can get a feel for some of the things to look for. So, oh, actually we've got to do this one. Cost effective. Oh, let's jump onto that. Yeah, cost effective upgrade. Okay, this sort of leads into the design. I think I skipped the slide there. Okay, so um, one of the things, if, if you have an existing warehouse and you're screaming for space, these are some of the things that you can do. You can use some narrow aisle equipment, you can consolidate your pit faces, you can introduce one-way flow. Um, as we said before, you can use the available height in a facility to better effect. You can extend your building, and I'm going to take you through a case study in a moment that will cover number five. Um, or many companies actually outsource part of their range. Uh, for example, bog pallets. So um, it's interesting. I think more and more in Australia, we're seeing companies uh, that outsource part of their range than full, their full range uh, for a number of reasons. And but they do tend to do this. They don't do that with their, you know, their fast-moving um, small stuff. It's it's more the bulk goods that they're outsourcing. That's just a, a trend that we've we've noticed. 
Okay, so now over to designing warehouses. So, just a definition, a, where, a warehouse, what is a warehouse? It's really a planned space for the efficient accommodation and handling of goods and materials. The entire purpose of a warehouse is a buffer for storage to smooth out fluctuations in supply and demand. That's the only reason why it's there. So we try to make sure that that buffer is neither too big nor too small. And that's, that's the critical thing to look at. So let's go over to some of the drivers of warehousing design. Um, you can see here customer service needs, they're high on the list. What is your service delivery offering for the customer? You know, for example, response times, what type of customers, um, you know, are there emergency order needs, are you in the healthcare industry, you have to supply stuff within hours, or are you in, um, you know, a wholesale industry where you've got a lot more leeway in terms of uh, mm. supply? Your storage and handling needs, um, you know, the demand, uh, are you on site, strategic versus normal stock, um, and uh, what sort of storage and handling methods are you using. The appropriate processes in warehouse design, the layout options, the cost versus benefit of each option. Are you going to automate, semi-automate, or not automate at all? There's quite a bit of detail on there, Mal, and I'm just, just conscious of the, uh, the time that we've got. How about we... Uh, Take a couple of these more complicated slides, and we'll put them up on the, on our blog later on today. Yeah, sure. And we'll, okay. we'll let everybody know where those okay. are. All right, we can do it. Yeah. Okay, so let's uh, you can see some of those. Let's go over to the next one. I'm not going to run through this one either, but sufficient to say that the best solution is an amalgam of a lot of these items here. So we look at some of those, some in more more detail in some operations, and some in less detail. So you can have a look at those separately. Okay, seven principles of design. I've sort of touched on these. We always determine the objective of the facility, define the volumes, we match the storage modes, always go for one-way flow, close to zero touches. We always evaluate our options and we consult widely. If we do these seven things, then we've got a very good chance that the design is going to work for a warehouse. Okay, now I'm going to give you a couple of rules of thumb and then we'll look at the, uh, the case study. Um, just out of interest, I'm, I'm not sure whether people are aware of this, but an ideal block of land is really on a ratio of about 1.7 to 1 to 2 to 1 in terms of size. Um, for those of you who are familiar with soccer or football, um, it's played on a field 100 metres by 50 metres. That's a typical two to one ratio size. But often, probably the best size is maybe around about 1.7, 1.8 uh, to one. The building aspect okay, ratio. That's interesting. So we don't want a square block of land. We, we want something that's rectangular, ideally. Generally. Yeah. It just works better for warehousing operations. Um, and it works well with the, mm. the overall footprint. The building aspect ratio is similar, 1.7 to one to two, two to one. So that's the size of the building on the block of land. Correct. Yeah. And in most locations, the size of the warehouse compared to the block of land is about 50%. So if you've got a 10,000 square metre block of land, you would probably put a 5,000 square metre warehouse. To allow for manoeuvring areas and car parks. Yeah. And rest of the As a rule of thumb. Yeah. Um, a lot of warehouses in Australia are built to this level, 9.5 to 10.5 metres. And, and that's an interesting element. Uh, I mean, I, I noticed someone typed in a question earlier on saying that uh, for industrial land, you know, you're trying to maximise the footprint. Absolutely right. You, you've got to get a good return on that, uh, the capital you've expended for that land. But it varies considerably, doesn't it, depending on land cost, uh, city where, well, not city warehouses, but warehouses close to a city versus rural areas. Um, you know, in, in countries where land is not so expensive, you tend not to go high. You might you might have a warehouse that's you know three or four pallets high, and you you go for a bigger footprint. So it does vary considerably, um, and I suppose we need to appreciate that these rules of thumb are really for a, a sort of quite a high cost land country, if that makes sense. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And and certainly in uh, in Europe and and mm. many areas in Asia, 
automatic storage and retrieval systems can get, can be as high as 20 or 30 meters or, or 40 meters high. So uh, we acknowledge that. Um, in a conventional storage racking, um, as a rule of thumb, uh, pallet per square meter is about 1 to 1.2. So if you've got a 5,000 square meter warehouse, I can tell you that uh, you're going to get about 6,000 pallets in that. And uh, so you do the mental arithmetic, you can sort of size facilities fairly quickly. Oh, sorry. No, you, you can. Um, as, an, as another rule of thumb, about 20% of warehouse floor should be left for non-storage operations, which is really about receiving, dispatching and staging. Uh, now that may go up to 25%. And the variable between that space is whether goods are waved or sent out in waves uh, across the day. Uh, if, you're, if you're not doing waves, then you may need to allow for 25% floor space. Mm. But if you're waiving your stock, in other words, if you're sending out deliveries at sort of multiple times per day, then you can allow less warehouse floor space for those sorts of operations. Truck turning space, 30 to 40 square uh, metres at the, at the, uh, so that semi-trailers can back in and move out. Um, I always plan for driver side reversing. I think that's an important point. That's an important point, depending where you are in the world. So if, if you're in a right-hand drive truck, reversing around to the right is always easier because the driver can, uh, you know, use of mirrors and looking, looking out the window can see the obstacles. It's very hard, or it's, it's harder to reverse the other way. So if you're in uh, the States or other left-hand drive places, a left-hand reverse is easier. Okay, indeed. Uh, I mentioned this before, do, don't, do not crimp aisles for sake of a few extra bays of storage and avoid funnels. So there's, there's a few tips there for you. Now we're going to go over just to look at a couple of... Uh, oh, no, sorry, I'm stealing your mouse to answer a question, go on. Okay, so, okay, we'll look at a couple of design options here. There's, there's three types. You can have a U-shape, an I-shape or an L-shape warehouse. A U-shaped warehouse has receiving in and dispatch out here, so it come it works in a U. Okay. An I-shape normally has a separate receiving area and a separate dispatch area. This is really good, but this does require more floor space than the U-shaped design. So, what what are the benefits of this? Well, the benefits of this is that you can isolate your receiving from your dispatch and therefore you're not mixing mm -hmm. products together. Yep. You can also have separate uh, receiving staff versus separate dispatch area and they're not getting in the way. Um, but the biggest benefit is that you're getting one-way one way flow directly through the warehouse. Okay. Um, this, these sorts of warehouses are often used in, by third-party logistics companies mm -hmm. and large retail retailers and so forth. The U-shaped design is used for warehouses that may be smaller in size. We've got a couple more questions coming in here. If you don't mind, we'll we'll just try and get through the rest of your material in the next 10 minutes, Mel. Yep. And then for those who've got a little bit of time, if you want to hang on at the end, we'll go through all of those questions. Okay. Right, now I'm just going to run through a, a case study of an organisation that has an existing warehouse. And you can see that on this screen here. I'm just... Okay. So. This company has a 5,000 square, 5, square metre square warehouse. So remember we were talking a few minutes ago about the right shape of the building. If you have a look at this building, um, it has uh, a drive-in racking layout. It's an old building and all of these little dots here that you can see are actually columns. So this building was probably built around the, uh, the 1940s um, and it's a, it's a sawtooth type uh, design. Now, I'll just point out a couple of things here. This company has a need to grow and it has a very large online business that, is, that has grown very rapidly over the last uh, few years. So you can see it has lots of driving racking here uh, in pallets on the ground. It has four uh, receiving docks there. These are like um, sunken docks where the, the, the semi-trailer is back in. The road is out here, so you can see it doesn't have much room to back in. So the council 
uh, is complaining that they have lots of trucks parking out on the street. It has uh, an office down here and the driveway into the facility is down through here. It's really congested, isn't it? Very congested. And remember I talked a minute about having a funnel? That's a funnel, Rob. <laughs> um, you can see there's an old silo here from a prior use of this property. And there's a garden and they've got storage containers here. The thing about this warehouse is that it's very congested. They can't bring goods in. And they're shipping a lot of goods out now, not through the back of the truck, but they're side loading, as I mentioned before. So there's a lot of issues around this. Another thing, they have a spare block of land here, and there's a, uh, a nest of blue ducks sitting down here, which are a very <laughs> rare type of duck. Okay? That's very common in a lot of countries around the world. We have to be very environmental and not disturb the ducks or the Correct. frogs or whatever. Yeah. Now, why should I mention that? These are some of the things that happen when we look at designing warehouses. How do we deal with blue ducks and how do we deal with congestion around incoming vehicles and so on? So they're very lucky in this case that they have spare land. Exactly. So for this company, I'll just go to the next slide. Ah, yeah, okay, so this is the elevation. You can see a sawtooth roof. Now, what we did with this one is we expanded it. We almost, we've doubled the size effectively. I think we've doubled it by about, a, that's 5,000. We've put about 4,500 in here. But what we did is we did use the adjacent land. We've less, left the blue ducks where they are. Very good. Um, and so what we've done is we built an existing building onto the end here. So the blue is the existing building. We've put a future extension on here, which is the light blue. We've, we've changed the, uh, the trucking load. We've still got some suck and dots, but we only use that for the end loaded vehicles. But what we've now introduced is a flow through area for semi trailers and B doubles that require side loading of product. And you can see instead of coming through here, we now bring them through this entry and we flow them through the warehouse like this out the gate. And for these vehicles, they come and they nose in here and they back into there and they can go straight out that gate as well. Another very important issue is we've separated the vehicle movement from the domestic car operation. So we put an office here and all of the traffic that goes to the office has a separate gate to move in and out. We also have allowed an area for extension out the back in this green area. Let's go to the next slide. Here you can see some of the, uh, the racking uh, and, uh, and layout arrangements that we've introduced. So we have lots of staging for orders going out. We have some drive-in racking. We put some selective racking in, which is quite common. So, Mel, the different type of racking here, what, what's driving that is obviously trying to maximise the cube of the warehouse, store as many pallets as we can, uh, and, and then it's also the throughput, isn't it? Depending how quickly we're accessing those pallets will determine the type of racking that goes into yeah, it. That's correct. Yeah, so we have, yeah, we have very uh, fast-moving bolt stocks here. We have uh, sort of medium size. Low, you know, low number of pallets per product here. We have what we call a picking module in this area where we consolidate the pick face and we do all of the etches picking in that area. And then we have some shelving where we pick off the shelving in this area here. We put in a little uh, sortation system and con conveyors to actually deal with the sorted orders and we're dispatching most of those orders out to these vehicles. So over in the next slide, you can see the transport flows. So the red is incoming. So the vehicles are coming in, the stock's coming in through here, and that product is flowing through into the pick module and eventually out the door through here. So would it be fair to say that in most warehouses of you know, any decent size, let's say you know, four or 5,000 square metres, that companies are really going now for this sort of hybrid solution? It's really gone are the days where you'd walk into a warehouse and see just standard pallet racking four or five pallets high. Oh yeah, it's definitely you, you get a hybrid because it's based on the uh, on the movement of, of the products, and so what we often use what we call Pareto analysis to yeah. work that out. So we understand what are the high volume products versus the lower ones. Okay, so over the next page, um, this is the elevation of that warehouse. You can see how we've joined up the sawtooth warehouse with a new one. 
we've given it some more roof height. It's still a commercial grade building, so it's available, you know, for later selling in the market. And we've got a uh, a picking module here, so we might start by doing a two level pick module, and then build later to a third one. And we put in what we call carton live storage and some uh, pallet flow racking for picking purposes. Okay, so uh, that's the cross section there. So what we've covered today, because we're just about to wrap up, is we've done the seven common performance issues that, that we've gone through, the multiple touches of the goods, the multi-directional flow, stock being in the wrong place, stock locations are unclear, inefficient labour, we've looked at racking and equipment, and we've looked at loading and unloading. We've also covered three easy do-it-yourself fixes, using a statistical approach to warehouse operation, always avoid planning, for averages. We've uh, we looked at killing the overtime bug, and thirdly, we've introduced one-way flow, one-way flow, and minimal touches of goods. Okay, so uh, there were some questions coming in there, and we're happy to hang back and and take all those questions. Uh, but firstly, we've promised you some extra information, so let me just show you where that is, uh, and then we'll start to work through some of those questions. So, if anyone needs to get away on the dot on the hour, uh, you can do that just in a moment. Um, first of all, I mentioned we're going to put up some of the key slides there with a lot of detail on our blog. If you haven't visited our blog, it's a very simple uh, one to find. It's logisticsbureau.com forward slash blog. And I'll make sure by the end of today that some of those key slides are up there um, so that you can grab those. In terms of other information that you might like to access, um, if you really want to learn a lot more about this topic and others, other supply chain topics, um, why not go over and have a look at our bookstore, which is supplychainsecretsbooks.com, uh, and you'll find five ebooks there uh, that you can download, and they all come with uh, additional material and videos and PowerPoints and so on. Have a, have a look through those, and you'll see different topics. There's topics on warehousing as well, so a lot more information uh, backing up what we talked about today. We, we promised um, to have a look at some of those. Alex, I might um, just ask you to come over here and have a look at this screen because I'm having problems seeing the questions. Um, so we've got a question here um, talking about 3PL under a cost and commercial relationship. Okay. Uh, critical KPIs. Um, critical KPIs you recommend an organization implement to monitor and motivate 3PL under a cost plus commercial arrangement. Wow, <laughs> that's a webinar in itself. Um, I'll tell you what, rather than answer it here and now, should we do a webinar on that topic? Because that's actually a really good question. Um, all I would say, whoever asked that question, jump onto our blog, look under outsourcing and 3PL. There is loads of information there about different um, contract costing mechanisms and KPIs. It's all there. Uh, I'm sure you'll find exactly what you want, but I, I think actually that would be a great topic for uh, for another webinar. Yeah. Um, so, are there, are there any other? I'm, I'm not avoiding the question; it's just it's fully answered on on the blog there. Uh, any other questions before we wrap up? We're happy to hang on as long as you like. Uh, oh, I think we've answered the one about um, the pallet per square meter is based on the height. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So that, the question about the pallet per square meter at 1.2, is it based on the height of 9.5 to 10.5? Oh, look, you, it's probably based on about 8 meters, so you might go up to 1.25 for 9 yeah. to 10.5 meters. Okay. okay. We, we will go through all of these questions, so don't worry if you have a question, we're going to answer it. Uh, for those who, who need to jump off and, uh, and you know, get on with meetings and business and so on, we fully appreciate it. Um, and thank you so much for give, giving up our time, but you're more than welcome to stay with us because we're going to go through all of these questions. Critical KPIs we talked mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. um, the 20% free space is excluding the gap between the racking. It's uh, not, is it? No, it's not. So you, if you had, for example, 4,000 square metres of racking, um, then I would add the 20% yeah. on 20%. So, so it's, it's the space occupied by the racking, it's the aisles and between the, aisles, the racking, 20% on top of that yeah. is a rough rule of thumb. How do you operate with four deep racking? Yeah, look, um, it's tricky. 
the easiest way to answer that, and you know, Mel's the expert, so jump in if I'm answering this incorrectly. Uh, think of that sort of deep racking like block stacking almost. You've got to have a lot of product in batch quantity, the same manufacturing date, to be able to turn it over. Because obviously if it's, it's, if it's four deep, you're pulling out the first ones, then the second ones, then the third ones, then the fourth ones. And all of that space can only be reoccupied once you've taken all of those pallets out. So it's rather like block stacking in a way. There's a, there's a rule of thumb around that. And it would be typically drive-in racking that, that would use that. And in that case, you wouldn't put any pallets in there with any less than about 20 to 30 pallets per skew in that type of racking. Okay. Uh, this one, we mentioned side loading for dispatching. Does the receiving area also allow for side loading and dispatching or receiving, I guess you mean? Uh, no, because we would normally do that outside the receiving area. Mm -hmm. But what you must do for side loading these days is allow an awning to cover that so that uh, for wet weather, um, you're not you're not being restricted in loading. Yeah, lots of people are saying, can we get a, a copy of the slides? Unfortunately, we can't provide the whole slide deck, um, but what we'll do is we'll provide some of the critical slides on the blog for you. It's just this, we're happy to share this, um, you know, in, in, in this sort of environment, but uh, we'll put some of the critical ones on the blog for you. Uh, any more? Let's see. Okay, uh, we've got one here. When you say touch good four times is ideal, does this mean you touch the skew four times per day, as in you replenish that? No, no, it doesn't mean that. Uh, what we're doing is basically saying try to minimize the number of times that you actually touch the goods. And did you talk about four times probably as being the average? Uh, yeah, I said probably uh, five to seven is yeah. okay. For yes, a, you've, got to, you've got to handle it off the truck when you receive it. You've, you've got to put it put away. away. You may put it into a replenishment location. You may take it from replenishment and putting it in a pick location. You may then pick it. You may then load it onto a truck. I mean, it's interesting in your own warehouse to look how many times do you actually touch the product. Uh, you can probably get it down to four or five, you know, but if you're handling it ten times, you're incurring a lot of costs yes. and, and you're probably going to damage product. Um, industrial areas look for maximum building footprint, not load unload efficiency. Yep, I think we've covered that one. Yep, that's uh, it's all, all about return on investment of that footprint, absolutely. And any more questions? I think that's about it. Just scrolling through, yeah, I think that's all of our questions. So we'll close off there. And uh, once again, thank you all so much for uh, giving up your time. Uh, we really do hope you got something of value out of this. Uh, do jump on to uh, the blog. I'll just go back to that in case you didn't get the uh, the web address there, logisticsbureau.com forward slash blog. You'll find loads of information there. And for the people who are asking questions about different types of 3PL contracting and outsourcing and so on, it's all on there. You'll find loads of information. Uh, if you're seriously into the topic and you want some reference material, do have a look at supplychainsecretsbooks.com. I'm just going to have one last look to see if there's any more questions coming in. And I think that was it. So. Um, at that stage. We'll just say thank you all very much. Thank uh, you. We hope you enjoyed that. We'll keep in touch with you and let you know uh, when the next webinars are coming up and the topics. I think that one on outsourcing should probably be a topic in the future now. So uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you everybody and bye for now. <laughs>